So, let us uh, recap whatever we discussed up to uh, this uh, particular portion. So, in this lecture we are interested to find out the mixing and compaction temperature of uh, bituminous uh, binders. Now, as most of you might think this may be a very trivial question to ask because we have seen many bituminous mixtures roads being constructed with bituminous mixtures. So, what really is the big deal? Now, what we really need to understand it the binder should have a specific viscosity when the mixing and the compaction is happening. During the mixing the binder should coat the aggregate particles to a required minimum thickness. And during the compaction as the temperature is falling down as we have seen in the earlier slides let us say we start the compaction at around 135 degree centigrade and as we finish the compaction before 90 degree centigrade the binder that is coated on the aggregate particle as well as the binder available along with the filler what we really call as the mastic has a very critical role to play because it should essentially serve as a lubricant and allow the aggregate matrix to kind of uh, get compacted to with a close aggregate structure. So, we talk in terms of two in ex interesting extremes one is the lubricating fluid and another is the gel and at 90 degree centigrade when the mat when the roller is leaving the mat the mat should be stiff enough to even take the load of the roller without getting permanently deformed. And in fact, many a times we have seen in practice that if the rolling operation is not carried out correctly, the bituminous pavements have already been damaged even before the first application of the traffic loading. So, till recently there was no issue means up to 20, 30 years back, but when a big basically because most of the bituminous pavements were actually using only unmodified bitumen. And for unmodified bitumen based on a rich work experience that all of us have got, we were able to prescribe some mixing temperature and compaction temperature based on Newtonian viscosities. But in the last 20-30 years when substantial amount of payments are being constructed with the modified bitumen, it is found that these uh, exercise of finding out the Newtonian non-Newtonian temperature becomes a non-trivial task and in fact what we are able to say is if you go back and read this once again what it means is the viscosity temperature for mixing temperature range is 0 0.17 plus or minus 0 0.02 Pascal second and 0 0.28 plus or minus 0 0.03 Pascal seconds for compaction temperature range and you, you can either prescribe the temperature as a range or as a specific value. Now, what really happens when it comes to the unmodified binder? So, modified binder, I am sorry, modified binder is these procedures actually results in often unrealistic values for the uh, modified binders. Okay. Now, what, what we really mean is unrealistic values. So, if you hang on to this concepts of equiviscous temperature and let us say you want to shoot for around 0.28 plus or minus 0 0.03 compaction temperature and since the modified binders exhibit non-Newtonian response, it is going to be extremely difficult to find out the temperature and the associated shear rate in which one can uh, record such kind of viscosities and it has been found out that for uh, such modified binders complex as they are which we have already discussed in a, a separate lecture by Dr. Nivita, we are able to show that these temperatures can actually go to 190 or 200 degree centigrade in which case there can even be a degradation of the modifier that are uh, have been added in the first uh, with the first reason of giving an enhanced performance. So, what do we do now? Okay. So, if we have to really understand to, to try and find the answer to this question, we need to first understand what are real really called as non-Newtonian fluids. Okay. Now, uh, the literature related to this particular chapter, this uh, portion, uh, you can read it from 
the non newtonian fluids an introduction written by professor chabra from iit kanpur which was published as part of the rheology of complex fluids edited by few of my colleagues at iit madras right so let us look at this uh, picture a very simple picture you will see that on the y axis you have shear stress and on the x axis you have shear rate and you are first let us start looking at the newtonian fluid what i tick as this one is your newtonian fluid so the uh, newtonian fluid is basically defined by a shear rate independent viscosity so that means irrespective of the shear rate the slope of the shear stress shear rate graph is constant and this slope is typically taken as the newtonian viscosity so in fact when we say use the word non newtonian what we really mean is anything that is not newtonian okay that is what we really mean so now if you look at the other graphs which are more or less starting at the origin like this you are going to see two types of behavior so if the viscosity is now going to vary as a function of shear rate so let us write it something like this so this is the shear stress so for a newtonian fluid we used to write something like this okay so here this is a constant now what we will do is we will say that this is going to be a function of shear rate so what will really happen this can have different variable okay so this viscosity now can decrease as a function of shear rate or increase as a function of shear rate so that means the slope of this line which what i have marked here this if you try to look at this slope you can actually see that the shear stress is increasing at a decreasing rate so that means the viscosity is now going to decrease as the shear rate keeps increasing on the other hand if you look at this particular one you are going to see that the slope is increasing as the shear rate increases so the viscosity is going to increase so typically <clears throat> in the literature these fluids are called shear thinning and these fluids are called shear thicken okay so what they really mean is the viscosity reduces they are also called as pseudo plastic as well as dilatant fluid in addition to this there are some interesting fluids such as bingham plastic or such as visco plastic these are some of the terminologies that are really used here and you will see that this flow that happens here it takes some time so that means if you take this fluid keep sharing them there is going to be some amount of shear rate that is necessary to make this fluid start flowing so if if in that case a bingham plastic can show what normally the practitioners call as yield stress and then after that it starts flowing like a fluid a newtonian fluid and the viscosity in that case is called as a plastic viscosity we won't get into all those details and for a visco plastic material there is an yield stress here and the viscosity uh, shear thins as can be seen here we will focus our attention only on the shear thinning kind of a fluid and again this is a picture that i have taken from this ch uh, chapter by professor chabra what you can actually see here is this is the apparent viscosity versus shear rate graph you can actually see that and you are going to see that the viscosity variation consists of basically three stages in the first stage we call it as first stage and the second stage and in the third stage you can actually see that uh, in fact it is written as the brookfield viscometer or the rotational 
viscometer range or the conon plate viscometer range or the capillary viscometer range. Okay, the issues related to using different measurement systems for determining the viscosity when it is subjected to a shear rate sweep will be discussed later and in fact we have an industry presentation in which these issues will be discussed. But as of now I would like you to focus your attention on 1, 2 and 3. You can actually see that at very very low shear rates somewhere here you can see that the ratio of the shear stress and the shear rate reaches a constant value as can be seen here limit the shear rate tending to 0 the ratio of shear stress to shear rate is given by eta naught and this is called as 0 shear viscosity. On the other hand if you go to the other extreme of let us say 10 power 4 or 10 power 5 you are going to see that as the shear rate goes to infinity the ratio of shear stress to shear rate is defined by an infinite shear rate viscosity right. So, this is the viscosity that you are going to see here right. Now, the interesting point here is depending on the measurement geometry that you are going to use depending on the shear rate to which you are capable of measuring in your measurement system, it is possible that you can have either 1 and 2 or 2 and 3 or only 2. So, trying to characterize the response of this material in one single temperature over a range of shear rate is experimentally not possible. Most of the time when you try to start at the lowest shear rate and when you come to this particularly somewhere in the per this particular range you are going to see that you are going to exceed the torque limit of the material. And if you increase the temperature then you will see that you may no longer see a yeah, zero shear rate viscosity and the viscosity will start somewhere here. So, you can have combinations of 1 and 2, 2 and 3 or just 2 alone. These types of combinations are possible and this will depend on the temperature as well as the shear rate that you are using in your measurement system. So, this is the characteristic behavior that you are going to see and I need to also mention in passing that this capillary viscometer that is indicated here is the measurement system that is used for measuring the viscosity at 60 degree centigrade using vacuum capillary viscometer for our IS 73 and the 300 mm mercury vacuum that we give it results in a shear rate more or less of this particular order. So, that is why at 60 degree centigrade we are even able to measure something called as a viscosity. Okay. Now, how do we really predict the response of the material and in fact what will be very interesting is how to model. So, if we really have to capture the non-Newtonian behavior of the material so that one can determine the viscosity at any given shear rate we need to have an analytical model for that purpose. So, there are many types of uh, uh, models that are available this is the simplest model is the power law model ok and this power law basically the depending on the value of the exponent that you choose you can get whatever be the response that you really want. There are also other models called as the cross model which in a sense will try and capture almost all of the behavior that we saw here. So, eta naught corresponds to the zero shear viscosity, eta infinity corresponds to the infinite shear rate viscosity and n is the exponent that you tense here. So, this model in a sense can predict all the particularly all the three stages 
right so there are a wide range of non newtonian fluid models that are available the shear dependent viscosity basically these models are used for bituminous material pressure dependent viscosity borus stress dependent viscosity given by this discontinuous rheology given by bingham herschel buckley and the list is basically law and you can also have differential type of uh, uh, viscosity non newtonian fluid models of the rivling erickson's type criminale erickson philby rain or rivling and you can have ray type models which is burger's model we have seen you can see in the maxwell model and there are different types of models that are seen there are also models that are called as kb kz models which are very very popular in polymer literature okay so i am indicating all this to make you understand the rich amount of literature that is available to characterize the response of non newtonian material especially of the shear thinning type now the first question that we need to ask is if when we come back to our problem in hand the what is the problem in hand the problem in hand is to find out the mixing and the compaction temperature and uh, the mixing and compaction temperature has to be prescribed in terms of a viscosity now the viscosity is non newtonian so if it is non newtonian it is going to be dependent on the shear rate so if it is going to be dependent on the shear rate we need to understand what is the shear rate that exists in our material see for instance if you look at it there are different types of laboratory devices that have been developed for instance let us say you have a simple bucket mixture in which let us say a thermally insulated bucket mixture in which you put the aggregates you add bitumen all the required material and then start mixing them if there is a way in which you could measure what is the shearing rate between the aggregate particles you are going to get a big diverge range because typically even if you take a very small amount of material there are going to be thousands and thousands of interfaces and each of them moving at different differential velocity that is what is really going to happen so it is not possible to uniquely determine what is the particular shear rate so if you still average out homogenize it and then try to come out with one shear rate you can means if you really want to do it you can actually compute the shear rate to be of the order of 96100 for a bucket mixture for a pug mill mixture it can go as high as what is given here and if you have a workability device which is basically it is these are workability equipments for concrete are very popular but workability equipments for bituminous mixtures have not really been developed to the perfection and in fact at iit madras we are in the process of finalizing the workability equipment that we have fabricate preliminary trials are going on so you can have the workability device and it has a shear rate of this particular order you can have a hobart mixture hobart mixtures are basically the cake mixtures that you see which uh, uh, goes with a rpm of around 48 and the rotational viscometer that you see with a 20 rpm the shear rate is going to be only of this order and in a dynamic shear rheometer the shear rates are given as follows of course one need to understand that this can be easily computed by using a formula by assuming some kind of a fluid model for the material that you are shearing whereas all the other things that are shown here 1 2 3 for these shear rate ranges are always questionable but this is what is right now available in the literature so what is the this is the uh, for the shear rate so what do we now do now uh, what do we do now we need to find out how to uh, compute the non newtonian viscosity and as of now we can do it only with the Uh, binder because if you look at uh, these things these are all these things who are related to the mixture and these are the very high shear rates that are uh, postulated that are provided in the literature so let us uh, look at some of the methods that are available as of now please understand this is a work in progress it is not clear to most of the practitioners how one should 
interpret and use this material. So, most of the time agencies such as Asphalt Institute or ASHTO or our own IRC will always leave it to the wisdom of the modified manufacturers to suggest what is the mixing and compaction temperature in the field and they have their own way of suggesting a correct value. But there has to be a rigorous and analytical way of determining all these things and whatever I am explaining are the preliminary steps that you are seeing it here. Okay. So, the first one is what is really called as zero shear viscosity and high shear viscosity. The second one is based on steady shear flow as well as the phase angle method. The first one uses a rotational viscometer with a covert assembly. So, what you really see here is called as the cup and bob. So, you have a cup and then you have a spindle that is inserted inside. This is subjected to a angular velocity and then we find out what is the torque here and we use this torque to compute the shear stress and the angular velocity to compute the shear rate and based on that we find out what is the viscosity. In the same way you can actually see that this is a DSR dynamic shear rheometer and a parallel plate assembly is suggested. So, four methods are suggested. So, let us go through each one of them.